That is the most racist argument that can be made by either party. And I've seen candidates and individuals from both parties make that sort of argument. Jesse Lee Peterson, stop making that argument. It's Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back. I'm Van. We are all the LFR family. Thank you so much for clicking play. Hopefully, you click the like button as well. We are about to check out some more stuff that says I remember how a prisoner who was freed under Trump's First Step Act says that black people are starting to show up for Trump. We're starting to hear this more and more and more and more and more, more and more often. <laughs> It, it's it's not okay. All right, I'm just saying. I'm just letting y'all know this is this was going down. All right, all right. During his time in office, former President Donald Trump signed into law the First Step Act, a reform aimed at fixing federal prison sentencing guidelines, reducing recidivism, and freeing people who had been incarcerated for very lengthy sentences. Ended up freeing about 5,000 people from out, from these outrageous sentences, in the words of in, former incarcerated actor and self-described militant activist and filmmaker Craig Scott, who wrote in a recent article for Newsweek. Scott makes the case that the same criminal justice system Trump radically reformed is being used to discredit him. Uh, none of U.S. formerly incarcerated persons freed under the First Step Act are blind to that irony. Trump's mugshot only increases his street cred. Uh, that's the argument. Craig Scott joins us now to share his story. Welcome, Craig. It's wild that picture can increase somebody's street cred. It's a mugshot. You look tough. You look like, I got arrested. So... Now I'm popular. People, come on. And I get it. I get it. Imagery, image does matter. I, I get it. Playing these silly games matter. I get it. But we need to look a little deeper. We need to be adults. <laughs> we need to be we need to be adults. Let's say that. That's just the best way to say it. I'm looking at a dag on mugshot and saying that's the reason why I'm voting for him. No, it should be because of the policies. It should be because of what your family has to gain from picking the correct person to be the president of these United States of America. Come on now. Thank you. Appreciate you having me here. Now, this has been a controversial proposition as a number of conservatives took to Twitter following the mugshot, making the argument that the existence of a presidential hey, mug, mugshot would naturally lead to increased support among black Americans, the presumption being that black Americans like mugshots uh, or criminality or, or find that, that some kinship uh, in his being indicted uh, for election fraud crimes. So give me, give me the, the argument as you understand it. Well, I, you know, I, I can understand that, you know, from a cynical standpoint, but from a more, uh, you know, realistic standpoint, the mugshot represents an experience that a lot of disenfranchised black and brown people here in America have experienced. And it's that common experience that makes Donald Trump relatable. We have been teaching people how to grow online. It's been absolutely amazing. We have three people who have been able to reach monetization in less than 30 days. Growing YouTube channels, some from zero people. We have one guy who had two subscribers before he started working with me. He started helping him. His views went up 4.8 million percent. We're super excited. If anybody ever want to grow on YouTube, you reach out to me with the word coach. It also focuses the fact that there's, for some reason, the powers that be are after this guy. So all of those things is what are, are represented in the fact that they've got this mugshot of a former president floating around in the news. Is it that and, uh, you know, also the, uh, the uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, the likely opponent of Donald Trump, if he is the next nominee, has this history on um, criminal justice issues of, of being very you know, punitive, going back to the policies he supported in the 90s that I believe I, I read your piece um, had to do with your own incarceration? Now, that's the part that should move the needle a little more because of Joe Biden's part in it. I mean, the fact that. Joe Biden is the reason why a lot of people were arrested um, and are in prison. Kamala Harris is the reason why a lot of black people are in prison. That should have been a reason, but because of the mugshot, okay, I'm picking up what he's putting down, but still, I just, uh, I, I still think it's foolish. It's just, 
the fact that we see the image of someone who's the president that's been arrested and we like, man, we can relate to that. We're going to vote for him. You know what I mean? It, I get it, but it's still silly to me. That's, that's silly as hell to me. It should be deeper things that we vote for. Like we all have children, we all have families. At some point, we need to take that seriously and look at it that way. Like who's best for our families? Who's best for our future? Exactly. I mean, this is like he agree. the most Thank significant you, he uh, agree. comparison or juxtaposition. Here's the one candidate who was the architect of a law that ended up creating what they call the mass incarceration movement. And then another candidate who literally came into office and systemically reversed that same law. So you can't be blind to the fact that these two candidates represent two opposing views when it comes to that particular uh, uh, issue. Do you how did, I'm sorry, how did uh, Donald Trump systemically reverse the crime bill? My understanding is that parts, some of the most insidious parts of the crime bill involve the ca crack cocaine disparity, which various Democratic presidents have unwound. And I certainly don't want to take any credit away from Donald Trump for the STEP Act, but I am curious whether or not it's really accurate to describe what Donald Trump did with the STEP Act as having systemically reversed the 1994 crime bill in all of its harms. I love the fact that she asked, she asked the question that would challenge him. This right here, um, platforms like this that give you both sides and, um, and give you an, an opportunity to present um, whatever information that you want to present. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. I will look at something bef like this before I will look at one of those mainstream media networks that are only, are only on the side of one. So this right here has earned more points for me simply by seeing that right there. Even though you, whether you agree with it or not, this has earned more for me just now. Well, the best way I think that I can uh, describe it is this, is that when Barack Obama came into office, and many of us expected him to make uh, uh, systemic ch uh, changes. He didn't do that. What he did, he went by case by case basis. I call it the Oprah Winfrey approach. You get a sentence commutation, you get a sentence com commutation. So he never yeah. dug into any of the actual laws that were creating that disparity. But I'm sorry, isn't Trump on the other hand? Go ahead, Trump, I'm sorry. On the other hand, he made changes to the actual laws themselves so that it will have a more uh, uh, system-wide effect. And so that's why I call it a systemic uh, change, because he literally went into the legislation and changed it where Barack did not want to touch a letter of the uh, crime bill prior to that. Do you think uh, Donald Trump's history... Uh, Good job, bro. Uh, ...with the First Step Act, you know, something that was supported at the time by a lot of Republicans, although now obviously Donald Trump is being challenged. There are a number of other Republican candidates. I'm not sure exactly where each of them stands on that. I know some of them have expressed a desire to undo the First Step Act. You know, concerns about crime are starting to crowd some of the criminal justice um, consensus. Do you think this gives Trump an advantage over other Republicans that he has this, this achievement on his record? Of course, of course. I mean, listen, Trump represents an opposition to, one, the status quo in general, and a rebellion, if you will, against the establishment leadership of the Republican Party. When he was calling for legislative change in this area, listen, he had to drag Mitch McConnell uh, 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 screaming and kicking over that line in order to get him to do it. So he, uh, he, he spent a lot of political capital in order to force a lot of his own Republican um, uh, party members to support this uh, particular bill. So, yes, he, in doing so, he distinguishes himself from the establishment leadership of his own party, of course. What are the kinds of criminal justice reforms that you've heard about from Trump or other uh, GOP candidates in the race right now that you're really looking forward to seeing implemented if one of them becomes president? Um, I'm going to tell you, I haven't heard any uh, discussion from any of the other candidates about uh, criminal reform. And I'm going to be very uh, frank with you. I'm not looking forward to seeing anything in that area from DeSantis, who they're considering the second, you know, uh, runner up, if you will. Who dropped out? Who's out, bruh? So in this area, Trump 
has be, been the only candidate. He's been the only former president who's actually addressed that particular issue square on, and he's made a significant, I consider, radical change in that direction. What what kind of policy, as a formerly incarcerated person, oh, man, what um, you know, what policies are top in mind to help? Um, and people maybe who aren't even in as good a situation as you are, um, you know, be be rehabilitated. You know, we talk about recidivism in general. There's a you know, there's rising crime in some cities, not all cities. It's you know, it can be painted as overly negative by the media. Um, what do you think, for, you know, from from someone who's um, who's you know gone down this pathway in life and you know now has um, uh, has a lot to show for oneself, um, writing and speaking on these issues? What do formerly incarcerated people need? Um, so they can be rehabilitated in society without you having to resort to these really punitive long sentences? Uh, well, outside of, of course, just like what you just addressed, uh, there has to be a change in the sentences. The sentences have to be attached to punishing the person for the actual crime that they commit. And that's, you know, that's you know, on the sentencing side. On the reentry side, what we need in order to keep recidivism down is the bare necessities. This house that I'm standing in right now, the only reason why I have this house is because my family has helped me and is providing that for me. Had I not had that, you know, I would like to believe that I would still be able to, you know, do positive things, but just that basic necessity of a house, clothing on your back, food, transportation, Either organizations or family have to be able to provide that for those of us who are returning home if we want to really see a, a change in the recidivism rate. When you spoke to the idea that sentences need to be in line uh, with the actual crime committed, I presume you're alluding to kind of mandatory minimums and uh, the, those policies which, which drove uh, a market increase in the, in the incarcerated population. And I'm curious what you make of um, the emphasis that so many people uh, who are running in the Republican primary and in the Republican uh, Party, more generally speaking, seem to attribute a rise in crime to lax prosecutors who aren't uh, implementing long enough sentences for folks who are uh, arrested and convicted of crimes. Do you think that, that that's what's driving um, crime rates in, in some cities that are going up? What's driving crime rates is Joe Biden's terrible economic plan. That's yeah. what's driving crime rates, because that's mm. always been what has driven crime rates. This narrative that somehow black and brown people just want to commit crimes because they just want to do that. It, that is the most racist argument that can be made by either uh, uh, either party. And I've seen candidates and individuals from both parties make that sort of argument. Jesse Lee Peterson, stop making that argument. It's foolish. Somebody please, not, not Jesse. Yeah, somebody tell Jesse um, to stop making those daggone arguments. Stop it. <laughs> it's foolish. Talking about we need more white babies because black people are just off their rockers. Stop it, Jesse. <laughs> the problem is, is that within our communities, the economic opportunities are limited and facing those limited economic opportunities, oftentimes crime is the thing that we often uh, uh, end up turning to. If there were more availability of meaningful jobs, meaningful education in those same areas, guess what? Crime would go down. So yeah. this whole, uh, you know, narrative, I, I, I reject that all, you know, all, all the way. It's interesting. In particular, um, there's been some discussion about uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, for example, has advocated for cutting any number of agencies uh, that have historically disproportionately uh, yeah, provided yeah. opportunities for upper mobility for the black community in particular, especially, especially in an earlier era in American history when there was so much employment discrimination. Government jobs were some of the first jobs that really gave black Americans an opportunity to enter the middle class. And I'm sure, as you know from life and personal experience, jobs as uh, couriers, um, working for the UPS, thing, uh, USPS, things like that have always been um, significant opportunities for upward mobility for us. Uh, what do you make of the choice to say, I want to cut, I think he said 75% of the, the federal workforce and the implication of what that means 
for the employment opportunities for working class people generally, but black people specifically, given what you've just said about economic opportunities and the relationship between those economic opportunities and criminality? I would like to hear what he's going to do on the balance. Okay, if you're going to get rid of these, you know, government jobs and positions that many uh, minorities are holding, what are you going to do on the private sector side that are that's going to now integrate them into the private sector? Good question. And if he's not presenting that, then you got to see what he's presenting as 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 what it is. My I personally, my mother went from social services to employment through a program that basically uh, got her employment in the social security uh, agency. So I know what that is and I know that the improvement that that did to our uh, to our lives. So I'm not uh, going to take a position as if to say, oh, well, yeah, we got to get rid of all all of the government jobs. The problem is, is that we are underrepresented in the private sector. And what is he going to do about that? And until he has a program for that, I've got to be suspicious about what, uh, what he's proposing. Craig Scott, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. My brother did a dag on good job, and shout out to the rising um to the rising hill or the hill um and okay rising the hill is the hill. Um, shout out to the hill for putting Craig Scott on so that he can give his side of the story. Former incarcerated brother who is doing some amazing uh, amazing things. Yeah, so yeah, I heard it there. I need to listen to more conversations like this so that I can hear real people discuss how they feel about what's going on in the government and and related to their own personal stories as well. Because um, I, I believe you all need to start giving your stories. I think it's necessary. I, yeah, I probably believe that it's far too many people out here with a microphone, far too many people out here with the platform, but it's actually not enough. The correct people, the right people need to be heard, not the same idiots who keep on mumbling the same things and getting the same people elected when they're not doing a damn thing for the people that they claim to be doing it for, the people that voted for them. We need the correct people out there on the front lines speaking about what's, what's important to this country. But y'all let me know whatever y'all want me to know in the comments below. And if you have yet to hit that subscribe button, please make sure you do so on your way out the door. Thanks again, guys, again. And um, share these videos, and I'll see y'all on the next broadcast. Peace.